Yeah, I think it was you guys. <laughs> um, so first of all, I'd like to seek the blessings of all the devotees here. Um, like doing the talk of the inauguration of a festival, that's like big. But uh, Maharaj asked me a few weeks ago, when Maharaj, when he first asked, I thought you were actually um, telling me a joke. <laughs> but then uh, Maharaj was quite serious. And I'm actually quite grateful that Maharaj asked me to speak today because um, for two weeks I was meditating on what to speak about today and about the Holy Name. And I've learned quite a lot, I must say. So I seek your blessings that I can share something with you today uh, that can hopefully help you in, in your uh, process of bhakti and, um, and, and it will be very discussion based as well. Um, so I chose a verse from Bhagavatam uh, which maybe we can recite and then we will take it from there basically. So this is from uh, 7th Canto, chapter 13, verse number 31. Um, and I'll just read the uh, translation, read a little bit of the purple. So it's mentioned here, Materialistic activities are always mixed with three kinds of miserable conditions. Are the atmic, are the devic, and are the bhotic. Therefore, even if one achieves some success by performing such activities, what is the benefit of this success? One is still subjected to birth, death, old age, disease, and the reaction of his fructive activities. So this is a purple, a purple. According to the materialistic way of life, if a poor man, after laboring very, very hard, gets some material profit at the end of his life, he's considered a success. Even he again dies while suffering threefold miseries, are the atmic, are the devic, and are the bhotic. No one can escape the threefold miseries of materialistic life, namely miseries, pertaining to the body and mind, miseries pertaining to the difficulties imposed by society, community, nation, and other living entities, and miseries inflicted upon us by natural disturbances from earthquakes, famines, droughts, floods, epidemics, and so on. If one works very hard, suffering uh, the threefold miseries, and then is successful in getting some small benefit, what is the value of this benefit? Besides that, even if a karmi is successful in accumulating some material wealth, he still cannot enjoy it, for he must die in bereavement. I have even seen a dying man begging a medical attendant to increase his life by four years so that he could complete his material plans. Of course, the medical man was unsuccessful in expanding the life of the man who therefore die in great bereavement, everyone must die in this way, and after one's mental condition is taken into account by the laws of material nature, he is given another chance to fulfill his desires in a different body. Material plans for material happiness have no value, but under the spell of the illusory energy, we consider them extremely valuable. There are many politicians, social reformers, and philosophers who die very miserably without deriving any practical value from the material plans. Therefore, a sane and sensible man never desires to work hard under the conditions of threshold miseries, only to die in disappointment. Long purport, but uh, the reason why I chose this verse because it's something that I could connect very well with. When I was uh, at university and I, as I was growing up, uh, before coming to Krishna consciousness, I, was, uh, I always had this doubt in life. I was thinking, we are in this world and we're trying to achieve success and happiness. But I was just thinking, this doubt kept on coming, like I'm at university now, you have to work hard to get a good degree. And then you go out, you have to work hard to get a nice job. Then you have to work really hard to make your way up there in your career, hard work. You have family, then you have kids, you have to grow, uh, raise your kids in a good environment. A lot of hard work. And I wasn't against hard work. But my doubt was that what's the point, because at the end of the day I'm, I'm going to have to give everything I achieved up. So, so what's the point? That was my doubt I always had. 
And then when I came across this verse, it made sense. So I'll repeat the verse again. Here, in the Bhagavatam is mentioned, materialistic activities are always mixed with three kinds of miserable conditions. Adhyatmic, Adhidevic, and Adhibotic. Therefore, even if one achieves some success by performing such activities, what is the benefit of the success? One is still subject to birth, old age, death, disease, and the reaction with fructive activities. So this made sense. So this is what actually made me go deep into spirituality, so that maybe there is more to life than what we see. So today was, this was just the intro of today's talk, because um, one thing I wanted to share with everyone today is, and we were discussing this earlier on, that the focus of this weekend is the Holy Name. And uh, one of my biggest challenge or struggles in life is actually chanting. I, I don't know if you can relate to that, but I do struggle with chanting. And, um, and so, whilst in preparation of this uh, seminar, I, I really got a lot of powerful insights which I'll be sharing with everyone. <coughs> but one thing I realized is that in order for us to be successful in life, there has to be a constant introspection in life. We always have to be meditating and reflecting on how our mind is working, how our emotions are working, um, how we're interacting with people. So today we were speaking, I was, we were speaking with Shipra and he was mentioning something interesting. He said that during Japa time is a time when we reflect and introspect when we're supposed to just listen to the Holy Name, right? So he asked Brother Hari Prabhu this question, that why is that the case? Why is it that during Japa time, when we're supposed to just listen to the Holy Name, that we start introspecting and reflecting? And Brother Hari Prabhu actually gave him a really nice answer. He said that because we don't do introspection and reflection outside Japa, it is, that's the reason why when we do Japa, we do all of that. So the idea is that constant reflection has to be there. So what we're going to do today is that, of course, we're talking about the Holy Name of the Weekend. And maybe today's session, what we could do is we can actually um, get into a discussion and discuss what are specific struggles with chanting. You know? So once we actually understand what are struggles with chanting, and we list them down, we become aware of it, so then, in the coming weekend, when Maharaj and Buddha Bhavan Guru are going to speak about the Holy Name, we can address these issues and find solutions. Does that make sense? Yeah? So what I'd like you to do is, we've got the board here. I'd like you to speak to the person on your left, on your right, or in a group. And, and what you could do is, we can actually break down and come up with lists of struggles that we may have when we're chanting the Holy Name. It could be anything. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll discuss and see what are the potential solutions. Is that okay? Yeah, so we'll have, we'll, we'll have about 10 minutes. And your time starts now. Very far. So I'm listening and 
Sometimes I go to retreats where many problems, I have many problems, but I don't go there with specific issues. So then when I'm listening, it just goes from one ear and comes out the other ear. But now that we're aware of our problems and issues, over the weekend we can be aware and actually tackle it one by one. Okay, so what we could do is, one way of learning is sharing um, our struggles together because someone may have a struggle which uh, I may have not acknowledged in myself. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a list of all the uh, tr struggles and troubles we have in chanting, and we're going to list it down on this board. And hopefully by the end of the weekend, we'll have the answers to all of them, yeah. and Monday morning we'll be chanting in ecstasy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, let's make the list. So um, Shiv Prabhu is going to kindly write. This has got very neat handwriting. All right, neatly, thank you. Okay, so anyone would like to shout out? What are your struggles in chanting? Yes, please. Uh, like you do your chanting, you love Krishna back. Okay. And then when Krishna says we do our chanting more, if you love them, you do it. Okay, so okay, so that's a nice point. If you love someone, then you want to chant more. Okay, so I guess. Our struggle is what? Developing that love? Yeah. Okay. Okay, and, and you know, give me some like practical troubles that you have. Like, you know, it's okay to say that when I chant, I'm always thinking about breakfast or something. <laughs> it's normal. I mean, <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Uh, we had five of us. Sweet. So I'll just mention what each, each one of us. Please. Uh, one, one devotee said, when he gets started his chanting, and then he breaks, and then he tries to go back, it's not the same. So being interrupted in his japa right. causes him to struggle a lot harder when he tries to reconnect. Okay, interrupted chanting yeah. is a struggle. Okay, thank you. Another person said, Instead of focusing on the holy name, they focus on the problem of not focusing on the holy name. <laughs> I'm sure Sheep can write that one clearly. <laughs> Another person said, um, when he, he, just to get into the holy name is a struggle. In other words, to sit down and really become serious becomes difficult. And once he gets over that, then, then there's another struggle. The first struggle is to actually fix oneself in the mood of chanting. And the other person said, <clears throat> okay, maybe each group can have a spokesman and then yeah. each group can... One person can speak for the, the whole, their group like that, and that way we'll cover everyone. Yes, absolutely. That, that was appreciate that maybe a lot. So, and, yes, and another person in our group said, which is the common thing, that the mind is goes. Okay. 
and it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's going, it's going, going, and it's gone. <laughs> just going to other places, right. you know, throughout the universe. <laughs> <laughs> then my struggle was, I'm always trying to, my mind goes to my thoughts of the day's activities and coming up with solutions and ideas of how to improve my service or in other words, in my mind wants to tackle the unsolved problems or the the plans that haven't been planned out. So it goes to those things. Right. So Java time journey is like a planning time to do list, right? But I don't I don't plan that. The mind plans it for me. <laughs> Well, I just have a feeling you, you, you made that statement because that's what I'm going through, so... Um, and yeah, it's true. And also, Maharaj, um, uh, they say that all bright ideas come during Jaffa time. I'm not promoting that, it's not good. <laughs> Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, all great ideas come. <laughs> that's not how it should be. Great, anyone else? Anyone? Yes, Baruji. Okay, Haribo. Harikishan. Uh, Maharaj has already planned some few target where I was able to speak. Sure. So my right is already breaking my, my legs, you know. So the question, uh, my struggle is, like we've been, been like a six of, the, of us here. Our struggle is when we are chanting, Yes. sometimes we don't have a respect about chanting. Okay. Because when the respect is there, you know everything, if you respect it, you get more benefit. So by not respecting, you don't get the effect of the yeah. chanting of the Holy Name. Right. So we refer ourselves in Sri Hari Nam Chitamani. Then we come to understand that the way Marek said, sometimes we are chanting, you see someone say, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare. And sometimes it's keep quiet, you start observing other people. So you are in the Japa routine, then hey, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. So we are not completely having that faith. Yes. So, it's, it's our struggle again. You can break and down other interests. Yeah, we have other interests, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Maru. I think that's okay. enough Maru to really break down. Sure, so we've got some. Okay, anybody from the Mataji side? Oh, maybe we can get some from... Oh, okay. We're better for his fire up. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, already written half of these things. I don't know about uh, being tired. Yeah. I think it's like one of the symptoms. Uh, we were also speaking uh, that we don't have also the faith. Like uh, like that Krishna is like name Krishna, everything is in, in this name. It's like it's so hard to understand it. Mm -hmm. And also, I would mention uh, so many times I uh, find myself looking at the clock and like calculating how many rounds I can do, like maybe two more. Okay, maybe if I speed it up, I can like maybe do yeah, three or something. Yeah, it becomes a race against time, isn't it? <laughs> I asked one devotee a few days ago, like, when are you most blissful in your chanting? Because when I'm on my 16th round, <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't mention the devotee's name. <laughs> Relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody? Yes. Anybody from the match side? Yes. John. Thank you. Yes. Um, in our group, we discussed that sometimes we have like bodily aches and pains whilst right. chanting, yes. and your mind is focused on the aches and pains as opposed to the holy name. Right. Yeah. So if you have bodily pains, and you can lie down and chant, so that's fine. Uh, just testing you guys. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Absolutely. When you have aches or some physical il uh, ailment, then the mind does wander off. Yes. Um, sometimes when I'm chanting. I realized at that I forget some words like Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, and then, then again, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, and then <laughs> I realized, ah, oh, what am I doing here? Because I forgot something. Then I go back on my Japan, and then I chant again this uh, two mantras, three mantras, 
So skipping some parts of the mantras, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, you, what's that? Broken names. You wrote. Broken names. You put that? Yeah. Oh. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. She doing Um We had four people in our group, and uh, Mangla and uh, Radha Vinodini shared that uh, they tend to start thinking about the past. You know, this happened, that happened, why it happened, how it happened. Or they go into the future, oh, now I have to fix this, now I should do like that, now I should do like this. And so they tend to not be in the present, mm -hmm. is what they shared. And uh, Gordon Lila shared that um, when she can really visualize the form of the Lord in her heart, then she feels very connected and her Japa flows quite nicely, but when she is not fixated, when she's not really visualizing the Lord, then her mind goes all over the place and she doesn't connect and she doesn't feel that the job is going anywhere. And uh, for myself, I shared that I tend to have conversations with other people while I'm chanting the Holy Name. Like I'm talking to my husband, I'm talking to my daughter, I'm talking to everybody, invariably telling them what to do. <laughs> instead of listening really to the holy name. And the second challenge I have is making a to-do list, you know, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do that, I have to do that. So, so generally happens during Japa times. So yes. 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 Mind wanders from past, going to the future, mm -hmm. sometimes in the present, not being in the present. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Any other ones? Uh, so in our group we discussed that uh, sometimes, like uh, Mataji discussed that our mind wonders which has been covered already and uh, one of the problem we also discuss about hearing that when we are chanting we just not able to hear it. Uh, like we don't, we just sometimes, uh, myself I have a problem that I whisper, I don't mm -hmm. say it properly that I can hear it back. Mm -hmm. And uh, also environment we discussed that sometimes if you are chanting like uh, if you're doing simultaneously other things, like looking in the fridge, what we need to buy, like the pro problem with Grasta Ashram is that you have your kids, your husband, and cooking, you have so many things in your mind going on. So that struggle is there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You got that one? Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Okay, can I do? And I said, I want to chant for you, I want to please you, please accept, I want to please you and accept it. And then I can chant much easier because then I look at them and sometimes they look happy. So I said, oh, it's, it was okay. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I do not do that, then it's the point of no respect. Yes. So, so you're saying praying helps, is that right? Yeah. Like when you're in front of the Lord and you're making like yeah. a petition. And because then if I'm in, in connection with the Lord, I cannot be without respect. Okay. And so that, that gives me wrong. But that is not every day. That's not every day. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Any any last few points or struggles? Yes. Just let's get it all down because then we won't leave here until we find a solution to all this. Uh, one more was not finding time for chanting okay. in one group. And I just uh, came with one another one. Like uh, chanting mechanic, mechanical, not with feelings, but yeah. just, just doing it. for the sake of doing it. Right. Okay. Mechanical chanting and no time. 24 hours is too short. <laughs> I think most of it has been said. One was concentration, um, but also um, if you've not slept properly, so not gone to sleep early enough the night before, then the next day it becomes a struggle because you keep sleeping. Yes. So uh, sleeping, right? Yes. Japa time. Sleeping discipline. Yes. Right. Yes. That's a big one. Definitely have to connect with that. <laughs> yes, Mother Sachi. Right. 
you know, when you chanting, just because you said you will chant 16 rounds, and then it becomes a burden, then the mind starts going crazy, and he starts being rebellious, and he doesn't want to do it anymore. Right. And it's horrible. It's horrible. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're right. So sometimes it is just, we're duty bound, right? Or oh, because I have to chant, so might as well, isn't it? Right, okay, good. Any last few points? Yes, Mathis in the back. I'm each handling uh, especially at the temple in the morning sometimes. I can chant because I hear somebody's chapa in the different voice, different tone, different speed. And uh, oh Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. <laughs> and I should be very surprised sometimes and I stop my chanting and I can't hear myself. In this. Right, yeah. Um, disturb when you when you're in temple room and someone's chanting yeah, very yeah. loudly and it can disturb your japa as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Mark. Should we put race against time? Put that one. Oh yeah, race against time. Yeah, we got race against time. Okay. Punch it up there. Okay. Yes. Um, I've also observed that um, as the day passes, if I have rounds left, then it gets harder and harder as the day goes on, and evening rounds are very difficult. And when I'm up early and I'm chanting early morning in the Brahma Muhurta hours, then of course the flow is easier, mind is not distracted, it's the mode of goodness hour. So that's definitely a big, uh, big challenge. If rounds are left, then during the day, it definitely is harder and harder. Right. So early morning chanting is can be a struggle. It's the best. Well. Yes. It's the best, but it can be a struggle, isn't it? Yes. Yes. I have also one more problem, like um, organization of the day. Uh, while I'm working full time, right. like nine, ten hours a day, I'm at work or on the way to the work and back. So it takes a lot of time. So like hectic lifestyle also can be a problem, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's definitely. Uh, you got that one? Planning. Was, huh? Planning. Planning and hectic lifestyle. Sometimes you get. Just... Yes. Is that is that a magic? Um, not hectic. I'm uh, going to sleep at the same time and I used to wake up at the same time. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, when I think that uh, I have to go to work, then come home, then eat, take a shower and start to cook, then uh, I can start uh, to chant or I can start in the morning. But I don't know how to organize it that I wake up early and then... No. Planning. planning, yeah, okay, we've got that, right? you got planning, haven't you? Priority. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Priority. Yes, Prabhuji. <coughs> okay, the Wait till the mic Prabhu has given one. Wait till the mic comes. Okay, Prabhu has given one, you say, chanting with the expectation. Means you're chanting, you're expecting something. And <coughs> when the result is not there, it's breaking the people down, you know. Yeah, so that's the one. Yes, thank you. I forgot to mention one devotee in our group said something that hasn't been mentioned. He's chanting and then he's feeling the mercy of the holy name. He says, I got it, and as soon as he says, I got it, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's selfish, overconfident, self assuredness thought he captured Krishna, right? <laughs> Something like that. Right. That happens. I mean, that's a, that's a problem when sometimes, oh, now I, I'm in the flow. Okay, and then all of a sudden, there's no flow. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yes, and someone in the back. Someone had their hands up? Yes, Prabhu. Um, offenses to the devotees. Um, then the mind is disturbed and uh, yeah. it's not the proper mood even to pray. Uh, okay. You just think of it over and over again. Okay, nice. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a big one, isn't it? Offenses. 
Thank you. Okay. Do you think we have enough here? Yeah. If we can conquer this by the weekend, then I think we've done. We've achieved a lot, right? Okay. Good. So uh, I'm going to hand the solution to Maharaj and Bhutta Bhavan Guru. <laughs> We still have like 40, 45 minutes, so I'm going to attempt to um, like address some of them at least, you know. But the wonderful thing is at least now we know what the problem is. So we know exactly what solution to look for. So, uh, so this is a really a, a great exercise that, you know, is, is very useful and beneficial as well. So when we look at all our struggles in life, you know what it all comes down to? It comes down to one thing. And this is where you start guessing. Exactly. Huh? Shift, uh, shift, just go to the left. When I tell you, change. Sorry? Yes? Desire. Desire? What else? Inattentive chanting. Inattentive chanting, but let's just keep it like, um, you know, yeah, it, it definitely inattentive chanting, that's what it comes down to. But it, it all comes down to one thing. How we perceive situation in life comes down to one thing. Uh, helping Krishna out. Helping Krishna out, okay. Time, you said time? Two person will go through the same experience, but they will react differently. What is it based on? Perception. Exactly. Someone said it there? Consciousness. That's what it comes down to. So even all our struggles, these are like, you could say externals, but there is something uh, behind that, that if we address that, then we can actually start resolving all of this. So there's a flowchart. Yeah, okay, good. So, this is, um, I, I heard a class by, a lecture by Prabhupada, and in that, in that lecture, Prabhupada was explaining that how is it, how can we overcome struggles and obstacles in life, right? And it all comes down to the reason why we suffer in the world, the reason why we suffer, it comes down to one thing, right? Negative devotion explains is what? What is the root cause of all suffering? Ignorance, Ignorance exactly. So, ignorance. Now the question is, ignorance of what? Even before that, what are we ignorant of? Oh, I, I, actually, all of you are right. But identity. Identity, yes, Maharaj. So, actually, what we're actually ignorant of is what is our real need. Okay? We don't know what is exactly that we need. We think we know, but we don't. And in order to know what our real need is, you have to know... Okay, so our real need is ananta. Okay, so Prabhupada is explaining ananta means that our real need is that we want pleasure that's never ending. That is what our real need is. Okay? So, now, what we, what we um, derive pleasure from depends on who we identify with. So, identification is a big thing. So, they say that there's two things that we identify ourselves with. Either we identify ourselves with Material things, or material identity, or material consciousness, or spiritual things, or spiritual consciousness. And we'll see that a person with different consciousness will experience different things uh, differently. So let's, let's look at material consciousness. When someone who's on a material plane has material consciousness, what happens is, if you go to the next one, is that their vision is very narrow. Why is their vision so narrow? So Selfish, but why is their vision very narrow? They have some preconceived idea of what they want. Yes, that's there. That's there. But one of the reasons why they, it, it, their vision is narrow in comparison to their real need is that they are looking for pleasure just on two planes, physical and mental plane. So therefore, their pleasure is limited. What they want, they can't achieve in these two planes. Okay? And so what happens is, because your pleasure is limited, what happens? Your mind is disturbed. Right? It's like, you know, you're hungry, and someone just gives you one bite of pizza. Are you happy? No. no you'll be switching, won't you? It's like, no, I want the whole thing. Right? So, so your mind is very disturbed. Okay? And then when your mind is disturbed, what happens next? This is when illusion kicks in. So what happens is that you think this will give me happiness and pleasure. It doesn't. So then you look for something else, and you look for something else, and that illusion keeps on going round and round. Okay? So, and because of that, what happens? Every situation will lead to frustration and dissatisfaction. I couldn't read them, so thank you. Dissatisfaction. 
Okay? Now let's look at the other way. Someone who has spiritual consciousness, why is their vision broader? Because the spiritual energy, energy is limitless. Okay, that's, yeah, that's right. But let's go specific. Why is people with material consciousness narrow vision, whereas spiritual people with higher consciousness more broader? They want to serve. They want to serve, but they actually have access to one whole new dimension. The spiritual, the spiritual realm. Okay, so not only do they actually um, explore the concept of happiness on a physical, mental level, but also now they've opened themselves up into the spiritual realm. And it is in that spiritual realm where they can find Ananta. Okay, so now they can access real pleasure. They know what they're looking for, and they know exactly where to look for it. So when they access real pleasure, what happens? Their mind is peaceful. Doesn't matter what the external situation is. When mind is peaceful, then they are actually in tune with reality. They never get bewildered, they never get phased out. And that's the reason why in every situation with uh, elevated consciousness, you're always satisfied and happy. Okay? So that's why they say those who are a spiritualist, they, because they have higher consciousness, external situations, external people do not affect them. They're still connected and they're actually, you could say, blissed out because of that connection. Okay, so this is very. This is something I just want to share because this model really helps you to understand how we can deal with life struggle. Now, the common thing between the two kinds of consciousness is they will go through exactly same troubles and struggles in life, the three miseries, but the way they react to it will be completely different. Okay, it will be completely different. You know, so just because you know sometimes there's a myth that if you take up to the practice of spirituality you know, your miseries will reduce. No, it doesn't. Because as long as we're in this world, miseries will always be there. But what, what can happen is that you can be equipped with tools whereby you can face these miseries, basically. So that's why um, Bhakti Tita Maharaj writes his books with a series of spiritual warriors. So that's the reason why, you know, spiritual practitioners try to become spiritual warriors. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah? yeah? Okay, sweet. So, now that we understand this, so when we come back to the Holy Name, um, I want to share, like, I've been studying this book, uh, it's called Broken Names by His Honor Sachinanda Maharaj. Brilliant book, like, I, when I read this book, like, Holy Names started to make some sense, theoretically. And now, you know, I can see that when I chant my rounds, it, it, there is more of a conscious effort. So what I want to do is I want to share some principles from this book that Maharaj addresses, which is, Amazing. It's so fascinating that a lot of things that we mentioned here, struggles, it gets eradicated by the things that Maharaj has written in this book. So just to give you a background of this book, this book is amazing. It's actually, um, it's like a story. Maharaj says it's like a novel between specifically three personalities. There is someone called Vishwambar, who's like a sadhaka. He represents each one of us. He interacts with two elevated devotees. His spiritual master, Guru Kripa Maharaj, and there's another um, uh, Vaishnava called Sanatan Baba. So basically they're having a conversation expressing his doubts about the Holy Name. So I'm going to share that with you guys and then see if we can actually connect with that. So first thing is that this Vishwamba has big doubts about chanting the Holy Name. Okay? So he presents loads of questions to his teacher. right? And he actually explains that, you know, he goes to his spiritual master and he goes that, you know what? I am struggling in this material world. That this, this desire of sense gratification is too intense. And his spiritual master is actually explaining, yes, sense gratification is a, a big problem. Why? Because it mentions that uh, the fire of sense gratification actually burns away our spiritual intelligence. Okay? Our sp intelligence is what helps us overcome different challenges in life. So here, the spiritual master is actually saying, Guru Kripa Maharaj, that because of sense gratification, we burn away our intelligence. And what's the consequence of that? The consequence of that is that we don't know who we are, we don't know who Krishna is, and, and there is no, um, and actually material desires keep on increasing. Okay? So now, his spiritual master actually explains that what you need to do is you need medication. Okay? And that medication was given by who? Lord Chaitanya, 525 years ago. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so this is the introduction. So he's saying that if you want to control your mind, purify your conscience, purify your heart, you have to actually um, take this medicine of chanting the holy name. Okay, now he's not convinced. It's like, what just chanting? How does it work? So now they break down the whole science of chanting. Okay, so in the conversation, basically they say that in order for you to clean your heart, right, there has to be connection to Krishna. Okay? Only when Krishna comes to your heart does, does actually does the heart get purified. Okay? So now the question arises, how can Krishna come to our heart? Chanting, service, uh, these are, let, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Okay? So like chanting, like you guys all chant? Is Krishna in your heart? Yeah. It is. <laughs> right. So, so why, why are we having this seminar this weekend? <laughs> is Krishna in our heart? Sometimes he could be, but there are times where he's not, right? So does chanting actually work? Yes, for I remember Krishna said that I'm inside you, but you are not inside me. Because Krishna is in our heart. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Krishna, is, he's hanging there in my heart, but I'm not experiencing him. So. So maybe there's another way Krishna... Maybe because of Smarana. Remembrance, okay. Okay, anyone else? Thank you, Prabhu. When Krishna, when he hears me, I hear from my ear. When Krishna says to me, Krishna wants to do it, he's telling me, I can do it, I can do it, I And he tells me to do it. Okay, good. So when we're connected to Krishna, we can do that. But let's talk more about the connection. How can we get connected to Krishna? Help him. Help him. Through relationships. Through relationships? Okay, association? Yeah. Imagine you're going to say something? Uh, mercy. Mercy? Okay. These are very spontaneous answers we're throwing out. I want to know systematically. Yes, she do imagine. So by praying, Krishna comes in the heart, okay? If, if you want to know, like, I want, I want Krishna, I want to connect with Krishna, what's the process? Service. Hearing, service. Hearing, service. service. What did Prahlad Maharaj say? Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Svanam, Padasevanam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Rachanam, Sakyam, Atmanivedanam. Shri Devi Mataji thought this is a test. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I just well, need Bhakti Shastri. <laughs> okay. All right, good. So nine processes. But, now this is very interesting. Um, uh, Sanatan Goswami compares the different angas of Bhakti and their effectiveness. They, Sanatan Goswami actually explains that by hearing from scriptures and from the lips of the devotee, it's like binding Krishna to your heart with a silk thread. Okay? But what's the problem with that? It breaks. Krishna's independent. He can go away very easily. So that's the power of um, hearing. It at least binds Krishna. So that's a star. But it's a silk thread. Then he goes, even more powerful than that is meditation. Smarana. Smarana. Why? Because the king of the senses is involved in this. Which is who? Mind. The mind. Okay? So because the king of the senses is involved in here, it's more effective. So then Sanatana Goswami explains that you're binding Krishna with a rope. But, can, can that stop Krishna from going away? No, it can also go away. But, Sanatana Goswami says, Kirtan, it is a very effective way because it binds Krishna with an iron chain. And this also actually um, it, it involves the mind, so it's more effective. So that's the reason why Kirtan is very effective. Reason why is because there's emotions, there's affection, and that's what keeps the mind intact. So Kirtan is very powerful. So now let's break this down. Why is the name of Krishna so powerful? <laughs> so, it's Krishna. It's Krishna? That's, that's great. I, I, I really, like Marge, when I read all this, I really said, like, really? Okay, so it's Krishna, so why can I not chant anything else? I, I really needed to break it down so then my, my mind can actually understand. Yes, right? Krishna is the sum total of everything. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The holy name is powerful because it is Krishna, for sure. What, any other reasons? Aishwarya. What is the meaning? Because in Brahma Samrita, say Aishwarya Paramat Krishna. So it's a cause of all causes. So the holy name is cause of all causes? Yeah. 
I decide to have pizza from Charlton. Can I get pizza? And not any pizza I want from Holy Foods. <laughs> Doesn't work, right? No. But no, you're right. I, actually, is Mother Sachi here? Sachi wants to say? You, you mentioned something. Maybe you could share with, with us? Remember I asked you about, about why the Holy Name is so powerful? You mentioned some jewels. Well, I just read it in the book and it says the Holy Name is a chintamani yes. and it can fulfill everyone's desires. So to the materialistic people, yeah. he's fulfilling their desires by help me out, please. No, yeah. Uh, to okay, I have the book. <laughs> and to the to the devotees who have pure desires just to serve Krishna, he's giving them <coughs> his full total mercy. Yes. And and to pray and everything. Yeah, absolutely. So holy name is very popular, but like Mara said, because it's not different to Krishna. The holy name it gives you full taste, full joy, it brings attachment to Krishna and it fulfills all desires. So you have to be careful when you chant with your desires. But most importantly, um, it's mentioned in this book that the holy name is like a treasure chest. Right? A treasure chest, everyone's aware of it? Now what happens, what's in a treasure chest? Treasure. treasure. What treasure are we talking about here? Holy name. No, no, that's the holy name. Within holy name there's a treasure chest. What is in there? Yes. In this treasure chest is actually your own personal relationship with Krishna, which in due course of time gets revealed. That's the power of the Holy Name. We suffer from something called spiritual amnesia, and just by chanting the Holy Name in the right mood, with the right process, you can actually rediscover what is your relationship, who you are, and your connection with Krishna. So it is very powerful. So again, now, doubt still comes. This sounds all great. Is Holy Name all compassion and merciful? Is it? Yes. Right? So then why can't it just give me that realization straight away? I'm chanting. I've been chanting for the last six years. Right? <laughs> so why can't I do it? Every day I've been chanting 16 rounds for the last eight, nine years. So why can't I have that effect? If it's compassionate, then you should just give it away, no? Right. Yes. Marish. I don't know if this answers your question. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that for one who is offending devotees, the holy name mm -hmm. drives that person away from the association of devotees. Yes. Yeah. It chastises the person. So the person who is, con when we say continuously offending devotees, the holy name actually berates them, beats them, and drives them away. Yes. So that's another form of how the holy name works so yes. it's look it's look like it actually is a, a chastiser also yes yes Maharaj, that's that's one of the points i was going to mention that we're going to come back to the the point of offense actually all our struggles roots back to this one thing offense and out of the 10 offenses like there's few but offending vaishno is like very prominent so we're going to speak about that um, but in this book actually mentions that the holy name is very compassionate but it's because of this offense, it doesn't take effect. Just like, you know, a straw. Everyone's familiar with a straw? Can a straw always um, uh, be ignited by fire? No, if it's wet, no. If it's wet, no. So similarly, we, sometimes a sadhaka can be spiritually wet, and hence the holy name does not have an effect. Okay? Again, this sadhaka is explaining, but that's, that still doesn't make sense that he's not all merciful and compassionate. There is a distinction. Yes, I'm going to start you. I was thinking maybe, and we do have desires, you know, we want to please Krishna, but we also have also desires, you know, there are mixed. Mixed desires, right. Yes, they are not. Our desire to please Krishna is not the only one. Right. And we actually don't want just to please Him. Maybe it could be even a hidden trick, like we want to please ourselves by pleasing Krishna. So how is that actually for his satisfaction? Yeah. I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah, because of mixed desires. So we say, like I said, like I want uh, love of God, but maybe I have subtle desires, hence it's not being reciprocated. But all these answers are true. Maharaj explains in this book also very interestingly that even though we say Krishna and the Holy Name is not different, there is a difference. Okay, there is a difference. It's mentioned that when the heart is contaminated and it's got a lot of material dirt, Krishna does not come. Krishna does not come and that's the reason we don't experience it. However, 
The holy name is so powerful that holy name becomes an enthusiastic sweeper trying to sweep her heart, making it clean, so then Krishna can come. Mm. Does that make sense? That's the power of the holy name. Okay? But again, the sadhika is questioning, but still, why does it take so long time, such a long time? Why do we have to wait for such a long time? So it's not that we have to wait for Krishna. It's actually Krishna who's waiting for us. Okay? So in this, uh, Guru Kripa Maharaj is explaining that actually we are the ones who are keeping the dirt hidden from the sweeper. So there's a sweeper, he's trying to clean the heart, but we're hiding it away. We want, to, we want to hide it because we are attached to those things. And that's the reason why it doesn't fully get cleansed. So it's not that we're waiting for Krishna, Krishna's actually waiting for us, that when we're going to let go of these material things, material desires. Now, we mentioned one point here, Maharaj, you mentioned here that someone's struggle was interruption during chanting, is that right? So, actually it's mentioned even in third canto of Bhagavatam that the only way um, a transformation happens is when there is uninterrupted um, practice of bhakti. Okay, as soon as, that inter when the, as soon as there's a break in the practice, in our chanting, as soon as there's irregulation, there's breakage, then the whole process starts again. So it's constant, insistent um, exposure to bhakti without interruption is what will give that effect. So it's very interesting, I, I thought that, you know, there is like one day we're fired up, another day we're not, next day we're fired up. It doesn't quite work like that. There has to be consistency and then the transformation actually takes place like that. So, so what I wanted to do, so these are just few thoughts, but this book is very interesting. I just want to share one or two things that this book actually explains. Now, one of the things that I found very astonishing is, is this offense bit. That one of the reasons why there is struggles in chanting is because of offense to, to devotees, Vaishnavas. Okay? Now, in this, in this book, it's very nicely explained that just like how unintentional chanting can give you benefit, unintentional offenses also has a negative effect. Okay? Now, in here, it's actually given a very beautiful pastime of Pallad Marge. That even if we cause an offense unintentionally to a Vaishnava, there is a heavy consequence. And it can even have an effect on someone who's a pure devotee can also switch. So here there's a wonderful story that um, is recited here. And it explains that one day Pallad Maharaj was actually doing his puja to his deities. You know? And then his servants come and say, there's two devotees come to see you. And Pallad Maharaj said, oh sure, I'll come and see them, let me just finish my puja. So he was so absorbed in his puja, in his worship, that he actually forgot about the Vaishnavas. And in due course of time, the Vaishnavas thought maybe he doesn't want to see us, so he left. So there was that bit of an offence. And as soon as that offence took place, Pallad Maharaj had shifted in consciousness. All of a sudden, he like just kind of woke up and he thought, what was I doing? You know, how can I side, um, how can I actually be on the side of someone who's an enemy of me. This Vishnu killed my father, you know, so he becomes all angry. He said, and then he orders his army, that get the armies ready, we're going to go to Vaikuntha and defeat Lord Vishnu. You know, like, you can imagine the shift in consciousness. And then, at that time, Narad Muni comes and pacifies um, Prahlad Maharaj, and then everything's back to normal. But this was a point just to emphasize the power of offenses to Vaishnavas. You know, and, and they say actually, not just Vaishnavas, anyone that we see, we don't know who's a Vaishnava. So it's very important that respect is maintained with anyone and everyone that you meet. You know, because one of the things is when uh, devotees are very dear to Krishna, and whenever a devotee is offended or hurt, actually Krishna is hurt. And there's a beautiful story in the Chaitanya Charitamrita where Haridas Thakur was ordered to be. Um, beaten in 22 marketplace. Does, do you, do you, guys, you remember this? So there's a story with Haridas Thakur, he was chanting, the king was envious of him. So he ordered his guards to beat Haridas Thakur in 22 marketplace. And um, Haridas Thakur, he's transcendental, he was just chanting and he was praying to the Lord that please forgive these offenders. So then the Lord couldn't do anything. So what does the Lord do? He actually um, covers Haridas's body so that the whipping that Haridas got, actually the Lord takes. And then later on there's an incident where the Lord actually shows the marks that he takes. 
So the idea is that whenever Vaishnava is hurt, it's actually Krishna that's hurt as well. So that's one point I really wanted to share which really resonated with me yeah. as well. Vaishnava pride. One thing is also, now this is also very interesting, many times we say that sometimes we chant, we do someone's service to Krishna but Krishna doesn't reciprocate. Do you ever feel that? Yeah? It happens, right? Oh, Krishna, I've been, I woke up for Mangalarti this week, you know, no connection. You know what, next week I'm going to take a break. It doesn't work like that, right? Sometimes it feels Christians are reciprocating. But you know, even him not reciprocating, there's a whole purpose behind it. Um, who feels, out of all the devotees, who feels the most neglect of Krishna, no matter how much devotion they do? Who feels most neglected? The gopis, right? The gopis, like, there's so many prayers and uh, incidents we hear in Bhagavatam that... Um, uh, Krishna does not reciprocate and stuff like that. But it's explained that sometimes the Lord does not immediately reciprocate with his devotees. He waits and in this way intensifies the devotion. The example is again with the gopis. So, you know, we hear that Krishna disappeared from them and left them searching almost all night. And so they were frustrated. So now this is interesting. Krishna says, so this is, I'm just quoting the prayer. Listen, O gopis, who cannot understand my real intention. You know this verse, Maharaj? No, I just got a realization. Go oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> For those souls who worship me through chanting my name and other means, I do not respond immediately. Thus, I make their worship more perfect. Not feeling my presence, those devotees develop deep humility and feel, alas, alas, everything I have done is simply useless. Because I am so unqualified and offensive, Krishna has not even shown me the slightest favour. Let me be damned. Now this seems like low self-esteem, but it's not. Because I haven't finished the prayer. Let's continue. Vishwamba then uh, thought, so, uh, so then he's explained by thinking in such humble mood, an even desperate way, the fire of repentance. So this feeling of... Um, Repentance in Bhagavatam also is mentioned that when we cause an offense by just repenting actually burns away the reaction. So here it says that when we repent like this, it burns away all remaining traces of lust and anger that's in the devotee's heart and pure devotion, full of power and brilliance shines forth like rays of the sun when the clouds have disappeared. So when Krishna doesn't reciprocate, that's because he wants to intensify that meeting. And in that intensification, there is a repentance which actually burns away our anartas as well. You know, so that's the reason why Krishna doesn't reciprocate or um, so, so we think, but he does in a very indirect way. So that was one thing I wanted to talk about, um, how, why Krishna doesn't reciprocate. Um, but as I said, there's so many things that you can take from this book and I was just conscious of time. Um, I, I, I thought maybe we can share this later on. But at least we've got this, and this is very um, useful because I think we can take a picture of this and during the course of the week, we can actually look back into this. I want to end today's talk with three things. I want to tell an interesting story of Lord Hanuman. And there's two, two self-reflective exercises I wanted to do with the devotees because this is something that I've heard and thought about and it's something I feel that will help me in my chanting as well. Yeah? So first I'd like to share a story of Hanuman. Is that okay? Yeah? So this is very interesting and very inspiring. When I first heard this, um, it was very interesting. So we all know that Hanuman took a very huge task of what? Yes. And what did he do when he went there? He went... Yes, he did, right? But as soon as he gets to Lanka, what happens? is that he's searching everywhere in, the, in, in, in Lanka to find Mother Sita. He goes through all the palaces, all the um, you know, streets, like every single inch of Lanka is searched. And guess what? Hanuman cannot find Mother Sita. So now this is where, and this is interesting because we can connect with it. Sometimes when we want to do something in life, when we want to achieve something and things don't go our way, what happens? What does the mind do? Frustration and it thinks of the worst case scenario. Does that ever happen? You know, like, um, so, so Hanuman was in a similar situation. So he starts thinking, now just look at his thought process, very interesting. 
So now he starts thinking, maybe Mother Sita fell in the ocean whilst crossing it. Or maybe Ravan devoured her. Or maybe Sita just gave up her life after knowing uh, from being separated from, you know, her Lord, Lord Ram. You know, he started thinking like this. And he was thinking that all the monkey armies are expecting me to come back with um, telling them that I found Mother Sita. But as soon as they find out that my mission had failed, they will all give up their life. So the whole army gives up their life. This is what he's thinking. Now, if the whole army gives up their life, Sugriva can no longer live, so he's going to give up his life. Hanuman, sorry, Lord Ram, will also give up his life thinking Mother Sita is no longer uh, alive. And then with this, what's the consequence? Lakshman will give up his life. And then what happens? The whole Ayodhya will become a crematorium. You know? So he thought, you know what, instead of seeing all this, let me just give up my life. This was Hanuman's meditation. And sometimes this happens when going gets tough, you know, we, our mind just takes us from one extreme to another, just like this. But what does Hanuman do at this point? He just simply gives up, surrenders, and he starts chanting Lord Ram's name. Okay? And he just incensely chanting Ram's name, he's chanting, chanting, and all of a sudden, guess what happens? When he's chanting, all of a sudden, Chandradev, who was covered by the clouds up till this point, peeks out as if to see who's chanting Lord Ram's name. And when he peeks out, what happens is he shines in a particular area in Lanka, which Hanuman never actually looked because it was hidden. But that light actually shone and he actually could see, oh, this is an area I haven't actually um, explored, you know. And so, and so this is a story where Hanuman was actually, uh, when Hanuman thought, this is where Mother Sita must be. And, and this is interesting, I'm just going to read what Hanuman's realization was. He goes that, as he ran, a realization dawned in his mind that, den, that a dead end actually ends the illusion. Right? So whenever going gets tough, whenever you know, we're in a helpless situation, this ends the illusion that we're in control of our goals. And therefore we focus, or we fo it forces us to take shelter of higher powers that shine brilliantly and are eager to give you a definite direction. Okay? So this is very interesting. Prayer, when we pray to the Lord, chanting, is like a torchlight that shows you the hidden possibilities in the dark environment of our despondent mind. Okay, so that's why prayer is such a powerful thing and therefore chanting all this stuff actually gives you the intelligence to do the right thing, you know. So that's a very uh, a story I wanted to share. And now I want to actually share one more thing, two more things. Is um, So if we could go to just the, the letter, the writing. No, no, next, 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 next. Okay, so this is something I, I actually want to share with devotees also. Now, it's mentioned that Prabhupada actually, and Marge, you could correct me because I heard this from you, that Prabhupada wanted all his disciples to write every day, right? <coughs> write every day to Krishna because it's mentioned that there's so much things in our subconscious mind that we're not even aware of. We don't even know what's happening in the mind. But the best way to actually um, know what is in our mind is by writing. So this is something that I, I came across very recently that, and this you can dovetail it to however you want but you know it's like at the end of the week you know this is one thing you can try is write a letter to Krishna and this is a suggested format but your format could be whatever you want and in this letter you know you can start off with or whoever spiritual master Prabhupada whoever you want to that I am so grateful to you because and then this is where you write down all the things you're thankful for, all the things that you've achieved in the previous week. So that way you're actually developing this attitude of gratitude. That's your first stanza or first paragraph. Second thing, since taking up to the process of Krishna consciousness, and then now you write down, what have you actually achieved? Why are you here in the first place? What are you getting out of it? This also makes you aware of the things that you're getting. You know, it makes you aware that, oh, you know what, this is good, I shouldn't take this for granted. And when you do this, then what, re what you realize is, the third paragraph is, but despite all the things you have given me, I still take you and the process for granted. Now, this is where you can list down all your shortcomings, things that we, we fail maybe, you know, like, oh, last week, Krishna, I was trying to chant your rounds, but I lived such a passionate life that, you know, I had so much service, you know, I was driving my car, and I was chanting, and I was hungry, so I was eating my sandwiches, and I had to do my service, I was on the phone call at the same time. 
I know this is bad, but I'm working on it. So whatever shortcomings you may have, by the way, that's not my shortcoming, it's just an example. <laughs> just, uh, I don't do that anymore. Okay, so uh, shortcoming, what do you, so this is where you write down what you are lacking. Okay, so you become conscious of it. And then the last paragraph, but now that I'm aware of these shortcomings and lackings, I will now make a commitment to you that this week I will, now you make some sort of a promise or some sort of an action plan that you'll carry out that week. And this could be your meditation for the week. So when you're chanting your chapter, just before, you can have, be in that prayerful mood and you can actually try this out as well. One more analogy, because we still have five minutes. Um, so this is something I also find very useful. How many of you took the flight coming to this to, to, to this temple? Few of us. How many of you take flights or you've been on a flight? What happens when you go on a flight? What's the, what's the procedure? You have bags, right? Yeah, let's start with that. What do you do with the bags? Huh? Okay, well, we're getting too specific. We put them on a trolley. But when you actually check in your bags, your bags goes through, right? Right? And then you, uh, you're boarding the plane and you take off, right? Are you actually conscious or worrying about your bags? No, no. No, right? You're just blissed out. I guarantee you're probably checking what movie's on right now, right? Isn't it? I didn't do that because we said on show movies and that's even TV, you know? But, um, but do you ever think about your luggage? No. We don't, right? Are you even worried? Like, are you even concerned? Did they even bring my bag into the plane? Anyone's worried? Are you ever stressed out? Oh my god, my bags, the bags. Anyone? Yeah, yeah Vishnu Priya We have a few incidents the other day. We just had one, we just had an incident just now. Just, just yeah, yesterday. Right? Bavish Yeah. Okay, there are exceptions. <laughs> there are exceptions. But we don't, right? So it's mentioned that Japa period should also be like this. The moment the plane takes off is the beginning of our Japa. And the moment uh, the plane lands is the end of a japa. And the luggage is all our thoughts, all our to-do lists, all our, you know, whatever, all the things that we get distracted by. You just put it aside. And as soon as you land, what do you think of? Okay, I'm going to pick up my luggage. Then you can bring all the thoughts back. So that's, that's just one thing. Um, I heard this from one devotee, Gorgo Papa, and I thought this is quite interesting. During Japa period, we don't think about um, any other thoughts and you can just put it aside. Like that. Uh, Marge, there's one exercise. Maybe I can try that out? Sure. Okay. So, so um, someone mentioned about form of the Lord. Something like that? Form of the Lord? Mm -hmm. What was that? Um, if I don't... If for me, if I don't visualize the Lord when I'm chanting, I almost feel like uh, it's too impersonal. I have to have that vision in my heart. Sure. If I have that vision of the Lord in my heart, for some reason, I can connect very easily. Okay, sweet. Okay, so that's very important. So, and so recently, I, I came across a section in Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, of how we should meditate on the form of the Lord. Okay, so what we're going to do is show the full picture of, of Lord Chaitanya. Okay, can everyone see this? Yeah, I want everyone to actually focus on this picture of the Lord. Uh, can you zoom out? Everyone can see this? Okay, so I want you to describe everything that you see right now. I want everyone to meditate and describe me in detail. Imagine I'm asking you, I haven't seen the Lord, and I'm asking you, okay, describe me everything systematically starting from the bottom. So shout it out. Tell me what you see. Describe it to me. Okay, now let's start from the bottom. We'll go systematically. Start from the bottom all the way down to the top. Flowers at his feet. Flowers at his feet. Give me more description. Oh, what, what kind of flowers? Red, red. There are red flowers. Tell me more. What, red or roses? Lotus flower. Okay. Oh, actually, Shiv. Shiv, there's a picture of the, the feet. I just do that, maybe that might help. Okay, here we go. You see jewelry? Give me a description of jewelry. Toe rings, you see toe rings? Okay, what else? Let's 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 go up to his thighs. No, just no no, uh, just same. Okay, Tulsi leaves. Tell me more about his uh, the outfit. 
Tosa leaves. Tosa leaves. You see tosa leaves. I want this impression to be in your mind. Yeah. Tell me what more. Tell me more about the outfit. Ankles. Yeah, you get an ankle bracelet. He's, he's uh, uh, yeah, this is oh. outfits. Yeah. Outfits, yeah, okay, so just have that impression in your mind, right? He's like dancing. Let's go up. Okay, so now tell me the description. Same same pictures, it's different image. Okay, now tell me more about his um, other other features of his journey. Okay, so let, let, let's go systematically. So let's uh, tell me from his uh, uh, his waist. Tell me everything about his waist. Okay. Peacock. You see peacock, and you see, and then become aware of what is he wearing. Blue garments. Blue garments. Okay, good. Chest. Become conscious of his chest now. Okay. Become conscious of his chest. Yeah, and, and the necklaces, the ornaments. Okay. Okay. You got it? Good. Now, um, I want you to focus on his necklaces and his, uh, yeah, necklaces. And now meditate on his face. Tell me the descri description of his face, everything that you see there. Okay, so let's, let's start with his, uh, you know, his first of all, face. Eyes become conscious. His eyes is, is he has he got his eyes closed? Is he winking? You know, become conscious of it. It's open. Does he have an eyebrow? Is he, his eyebrows there? Yeah, good. Does he have a nose? Nose. What's the what's the description of his nose? It's sharp. Sesame flower. Okay, sweet. Uh, and now his turban. I see that sorrow pulse is there. Sorrow? Yeah. Meaning? Beauty. Oh, right. Yeah. Beauty is there. Okay, good. So, and, and just the final picture? The, the full picture? Okay, so this is. Uh, so, just Elena, anyone know where this is from? Eco, yeah, Eco Village. So, this is. Um, they have a DT of Brother Brindavan Bihari, and they've got a, a DT of. Um, Lord Chaitanya beside them. So, everyone's got this picture? So we're going to try something. I want everyone to close your eyes. We're going to try a meditation now, okay? And I'm going to give you a description of what each feature, by meditating on it, and what benefit do you get. So I want you to actually just meditate on it and focus on it. And if you forget, then open your eyes, the picture's still there. Okay, but try to keep your eyes closed, and let's just try this meditation. So in this third canto, it's mentioned that this is how a yogi actually meditates on the form of the Lord. Okay, and I'll explain why we're doing this, because then it can be useful when, we, when it comes to chanting. So, I want you to just now, um, first of all, actually just take a few deep breaths, and I want you to just empty your mind. If you want to sit straight, you can do that. Um, they say breathing from the nose is, is really useful when it comes to meditating. Straight back if you can, or in a comfortable situation. And now just take just long, deep breath as a, a, in your own pace. Just become aware of your breathing. Feel the sensation of the air, the warm air entering your nostrils. And feel the sensation as it comes out. If your mind is relaxed, your mind is at ease, and you're peaceful. Now, I want you to concentrate your mind on the Lord's lotus feet. Recollect all the different ornaments that decorated his lotus feet. The flower petals around his legs, the tulsi leaf on his feet, 
and if you can recollect the beautiful ruby nails. Just by meditating on this lotus feet of the Lord, it says that it dispels the thick gloom of one's heart. Keep that image in your mind. The Lord's feet is so powerful like the thunderbolt that it shatters the mountain of sin stored in the mind for a long time. This meditation on the Lord's feet is destroying many subtle material desires. Now, let's move up and meditate on the Lord's thighs. He was covered by a blue and white outfit. And you may see the garland hanging up to the thighs. The Lord's thighs is actually a storehouse of all energy. His thighs are whitish blue, like the luster of the linseed flower, and appear most graceful when the Lord is carried on the shoulders of Garuda. Now, meditate on the moonlight navel in the center of the abdomen. The navel of the Lord is actually the foundation of the entire universe. And from here comes about different planetary systems. Slowly move your meditation on the chest of the Lord. which is the abode of Goddess of Mahalakshmi. Lord's chest is actually the source of all transcendental pleasure for the mind and it gives full satisfaction for the eyes. Relish this. Become aware of the ornaments that's hanging around his neck and his chest. Now meditate on the Lord's hands as raised up. These hands are the source of all the powers of the demigods who control various functions of material nature. Now, shift your meditation on the beautiful face of the Lord. It's adorned with curly hair and decorated by lotus-like eyes and dancing eyebrows. By contemplating with full devotion, 
on the Lord's eyes can soothe the most fearful threefold agonies of the devotees. His glances, accompanied by his loving smiles, are full of abundant grace. Now, meditate on the most beautiful smile of Gorahari. By meditating on this smile, drives away the ocean of tears caused by intense grief. With deep, deep love and devotion and affection, Meditate upon, upon the laughter of the Lord. The laughter of the Lord is so captivating that it can easily be meditated upon. When the Lord is laughing, you can see his small teeth, which resemble jasmine buds, rendered rosy by the splendor of his lips. By following this process of meditating on the Lord, one actually gradually develops pure love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In due course of time, the hairs on the body stand erect through excessive joy, and one constantly bathes in the stream of tears occasioned by intense love. Gradually, even the mind which he used as a means to attract the Lord as one attracts a fish to a hook, withdraws from a till activity. In your own time, I want you to rub the palms of your hands, create some heat, and place it over your eyes and keep it there. Feel the heat sensation and slowly open your eyes looking in front of your hands, the palms. How did you find that experience? So the description that I was reading out was actually from Bhagavatam. This is a description that uh, Kapila Dev instructs his mother Devahuti of how to meditate on the form of the Lord. And the reason we did this is because I always struggle to connect with the deities. When I take darshan, I'm like, what am I looking at? Oh, that's nice, or this nice. But actually this technique is very interesting because it's a form of meditation. Like by different features of the Lord, by meditating on it, um, Kapiladev actually tells what happens. 
you know. So like one of them is like when you meditate on the smile of the Lord, actually dries up all the miseries and grief that we suffer in this world. And so the reason why I did this is we, because um, as you mentioned about the form of the Lord. So Mangalati is very important. It's important, I'm realizing it now, because first thing, 4.30 in the morning, you can actually have an impression of the Lord in your mind like this, so that when you're chanting and the mind wanders off, you can actually meditate. Not forcefully, but it'll come naturally, because you spend the half an hour in the morning like um, designing or putting that impression in your mind. And then the chanting can work. Yes, Shilu. You just mentioned the which verse of Srimad Yeah, it's it's the um, third canto, twenty eighth chapter, and it begins from verse eighteen onwards. So then there's a description of all the features. I didn't mention all of them, but just the ones that you can actually meditate on. Like that. So um I'm a little bit over time. But I wanna thank the devotees for your participation and for your input because this is something that I struggle with and you made me discover more struggles. So I'm grateful. Maharaj, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, I beg forgiveness if I said something inappropriately. But um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.